Okay. So welcome all. So it's a pleasure to welcome and introduce Professor Jeremy Gunawardene. Professor Gunawardene is a professor at, of systems biology in Harvard University. He is a mathematician by training, and he has been working in the broad area of signal transduction and the role of post translation modifications in information processing. So today he will talk to us about thermodynamic limits in cellular information processing. Jeremy. Ranjit, thank you very much. Um, and um, well, hello everyone. Um, I should say if you're in India, good afternoon. I'm in England, so it's just before lunch here. Um, so uh, uh, a great, uh, uh, let me just begin by saying uh, how much I appreciated the invitation and to thank the organizers for all the hard work of trying to keep this uh, uh, conference going online in the middle of the pandemic. And a particular thank you to Debashis Chaudhary uh, for reasons which will become a little clearer during the talk. Um, okay, so um, what I'm hoping to cover um, is listed there on the slide. Um, and um, broadly speaking, we're going to look at the issue of um, energy expenditure and the role it plays in particularly in, in information processing. Now, there have been a number of talks at the conference already in which the importance of uh, non-equilibrium dissipative phenomena has been clear. It's obviously fundamental to biology. You can't be alive without being away from equilibrium. Um, but I think in the context of information processing within the cell, the role of um, energy expenditure has been less clear. And that's what I want to try and focus on today. So we're going to start by talking about some early work of John Hopfield and the idea of the Hopfield barrier that comes out of this work. I'll then discuss um, the um, mathematical approach that we've been taking. It's called the linear framework. And then the particular area that I want to talk about, um, Ranjit mentioned that we have an interest in post-translational modification. That's a long-standing interest in my lab. But um, over the last several years, we've also become very interested in gene regulation. And uh, this is the area that I want to talk about. Um, and so let's, let's begin um, with um, talking about Hopfield and his barrier. Okay, so there you have a very nice photograph of John Hopfield um, doing a calculation um, uh, in a very relaxed mode. And when I first got into biology, which is a little while ago now, um, uh, I was many times recommended that I should read Hopfield's 1974 paper on kinetic proofreading. And it's a fact that if you talk to any molecular biologist, cell biologist and say, kinetic proofreading, they say, of course. Um, uh, and, um, uh, so um, ha having read the paper, I think it's taken me, it took me at least 10 years to understand it. And we're still come back to this as a source of, of ideas and inspiration. So um, if you get a chance to read it, I strongly recommend it. So what was Hopfield trying to do? At the time, um, the first measurements of error rates in uh, DNA replication, uh, mRNA synthesis were being made. And uh, people were finding some extraordinary numbers, something like, uh, replicating DNA, there's a error in the base, every one base in 10 to the nine. And Hopfield was trying to understand how this was possible. And so he put together a, um, a kind of analysis of this. And what I'm showing you um, below uh, the title the paper uh, is a representation of this in a somewhat different language, the one that Hopfield used. Hopfield talked in terms of chemistry, biochemistry, enzymes, reactions, and I'm translating this into a different language, which you can think of as sort of states and transitions. Um, and it's not meant to be formal now, but we will make it formal in a little while. So for the moment, just think of this informally. So um, how do you discriminate between a correct substrate, a correct base, and an incorrect substrate, an incorrect base? And um, it's very easy to do this without expending energy. Uh, you do it through binding. And in, this is the fundamental um, starting point for all information processing in biology is, is molecules touching each other. Um, and um, the correct substrate typically um, sticks on for longer. It has a slower off rate. And the off rate is typically the first step in discrimination. Now, if you do the calculations for what was known at the time, 
uh, you find that the error rate, so the sort of probability of um, the incorrect substrate versus over the probability of the correct substrate being selected, uh, is about one in 10 to the four, roughly. And so how do you get one in 10 to the nine or 10 to the 10 or whatever it was that was being experimentally measured? And Hopfer's idea was very simple. Well, uh, uh, and, I, and I often sort of talk about this, you know, sort of a, your elevator pitch for kinetic proofreading. Uh, Hopfield's advice is take two bites of the cherry. And what that means is you do two discriminations. So you do one discrimination, then you move to a different state and you allow the uh, substrate to bind and unbind again. So if you have an error rate of uh, epsilon from the first step, an error rate of epsilon from the second state, you'd expect, you know, epsilon squared uh, by doing it twice. And that's taking two bites the cherry. Um, so what's the problem here and where does energy enter the picture? Um, and so this is where it gets interesting. And the point is that if you think about systems in terms of states and transitions like this, then if um, the system is at thermodynamic equilibrium, there's no expenditure of energy, um, then uh, it can't actually tell how many bites of the cherry have been taken? Um, and this is what we call path independence. Uh, the path taken through this uh, the states and transitions, um, the probability of uh, being chosen doesn't depend on the path. And this is a fundamental property of being at thermodynamic equilibrium. And what Hopfield proposed was that, well, you have to take the system away from thermodynamic equilibrium, you have to dissipate energy on one of these transitions. And if you do that, you enter a different regime where at steady state, and everything here Hopfield thought of as being at steady state, at steady state, it's a non-equilibrium steady state because energy is being dissipated. Now the probability of being selected depends on the path taken through this graph. And now you can tell whether you took one byte or two bytes. And that's how you get an improved error rate. Hopfield um, uh, made a hand-waving argument that you could get epsilon squared. You can't quite, but you can nearly get there if you choose parameters carefully. Um, and uh, this is the basis of kinetic proofreading. Okay, so, so, so this is Hopfield's um, idea. I think uh, among many things in, in this paper, I think there's actually a more profound idea which Hopfield didn't explicitly articulate um, but which I, I think uh, we've tried to, to extricate from this paper and which has provided a, a kind of stimulation for some of the work in our lab. And this is this idea of the Hopfield barrier. So what I think Hopfield was telling us is something much more general than what he actually did. Um, and it's any information processing task that you might choose. So Hopfield chose uh, discrimination, but it could be amplification, which we'll come to. It could be detection, it could be uh, classification, it could be coding, it could be compression, it could be learning, it could be whatever you want to do and cells do all of those things. Given any information processing task, then what Hopfield is telling us is if the biochemistry that implements that task uh, is not using external source of energy and is operating at thermodynamic equilibrium, there's a fundamental upper bound to how well it can be undertaken. And in Hopfield's discrimination case, it's one in 10 to the four in the appropriate uh, model that you set up. Um, and the only way to get past this barrier, this barrier is basically set by detailed balance. And the only way to get past its physics, the only way to get past it, you have to expend energy, you have to take the system away from uh, thermodynamic equilibrium, create a non-equilibrium steady state. And then there's a sort of folk theorem embedded in Hopfield's paper which is the claim that if you provide sufficient energy, you can, you can, you can do as well as you want. Um, and he showed that uh, with a little waving of hands for discrimination. Is that true generally? Well, we don't know, but, but it's a nice idea. Um, but, but what he didn't think about and other authors have done subsequently is that actually you can, you can spend a lot of energy to do this, but you get slower and slower when you, when you, when you do that. So, you get into interesting questions of trade-offs and uh, the balance between accuracy and speed. And these have been questions that other people have also looked at in the past. So th this, this idea that there's an equilibrium limit to any information processing task is what we call the Hopfield barrier. And, and what we've been trying to do is to, to look at information processing tasks and try to determine their Hopfield barriers. 
And once you've understood that, then we can begin to ask the question, well, what, does, what role does energy play in giving us functionality beyond this barrier? So this has become a sort of strategy of following the energy that we've been trying to develop within my lab. Okay. So that's the Hopfield barrier. And that's a sort of, um, um, you know, sort of starting point for what I want to discuss. Now I want to tell you about the mathematical approach that we've been taking to doing this, which is called the linear framework. Okay, so um, uh, when uh, this was introduced back in 2012, it was a method for doing timescale separation in biochemical systems. So in timescale separation, we imagine that there's a sort of subsystem um, surrounded by some environment. And we assume for one reason or another, the subsystem is operating so fast with respect to its environment that it can be assumed to have reached steady state. So under certain circumstances, uh, it is possible to uh, decouple the system here in such a way that we can represent the, the, the fast system, the fast components. I put fast here in, in inverted commas because, and slow because components are never fast or slow, it's always rates. So, but, but it's a convenient way of describing things. So we're gonna talk about a graph um, uh, to describe this fast system. The, the vertices of the graph are the components in the, in the fast system. The edges can be thought of as chemical reactions and there are edge labels. The edges are directed edges and each edge has a label. And this label encodes the interaction between that component in the fast system and the slow components in the environment. Um, and we'll see a little bit more of this just for the moment, think of it a little abstractly. And if you have this data, a labeled a directed graph, then it gives rise to a dynamics. And um, it's a very simple dynamics. There's nothing complicated here. Um, uh, to, to create this dynamics, you imagine that every edge is a chemical reaction. You assume that the reaction is obeying mass action kinetics and you take the label as the rate. Now, if you just follow that prescription, it's clear that you can write down a system of differential equations for the change in the concentration. Let's imagine concentrations of matter at each of the vertices, concentrations of the components, the rate of change of each of those concentrations over time. And it's clear that because every edge has only one substrate, this has to be a linear system of equations. And so I can write it in matrix form. And if I do that, then the matrix that I get is something well known to graph theorists. It's called the Laplacian matrix of the graph. There are many definitions of Laplacian, so this is one of them. Um, and an example for the particular graph on the left is shown in the matrix on the bottom. Um, and um, it's clear that because we're only sort of moving matter around this graph, um, the total amount of matter is conserved at all times. It's neither created nor degraded. So there's a conservation law at all times and that's expressed in matrix form by the fact that the columns uh, add up to one, uh, add up to zero, I beg your pardon. Okay, so, so this is, it feels like a game, it's one dimensional chemistry. Okay, so this game turns out to be very useful. Um, and in the context that we originally uh, came, uh, developed this was actually in, to study post-translational modification systems. Um, and uh, just to give you a little hint of what goes on here, um, what, um, what you can do for these complicated enzyme-driven biochemical systems um, is you can, at steady state, you can uh, decompose them into graphs acting on graphs. And I've just given you a simple example here of um, a, a, a substrate S, which is phosphorylated on a site by uh, an enzyme E and dephosphorylated by an enzyme F. And uh, in the middle, you have this graph for the substrate but the labels on this graph are now derived from the steady states of a different graph. This graph is describing the mechanism of the enzyme and the enzyme can have a complicated mechanism. People often use Michaelis Menten mechanisms, but actually that's both uh, ill-advised and um, uh, actual enzymes have much more complicated behavior. So in principle, you can, you can, um, you can consider the complexity of the enzymes in, in this language. Um, and when you do this, uh, what uh, for these enzyme driven systems, you typically incur a conservation law for the slow components, which are now in this other graph. Um, and um, uh, here the, 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 the conservation law is for the, for the total amount of enzyme that's present. So what happens uh, is that this uh, way of representing things breaks the system up 
into a part that's linear, that's controlled by this dynamics, uh, uh, the Laplacian dynamics on the graph, and then a nonlinear part that comes from the conservation laws. Um, and this turns out to be a very productive way of studying the steady state behavior of these kinds of biochemical networks. And I've listed some references there if you're interested. But what I want to focus on is a different, uh, it's actually not so different, but a, a different way of, of, uh, of using this mathematics to study not uh, biochemical systems in the mass, but individual molecular systems. And uh, a good example, say, is a gene. A gene is a single uh, entity in the cell. Um, and here we have a graph, which is uh, uh, sort of representing the states of a gene, uh, which has um, uh, sites for a transcription factor, the blue oval binding at two sites, and sites for RNA polymerase binding at its own site, and now these states are not components so much as they're the states of the, 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 the vertices in the graph are now states of the system, microstates of the, of the system. And I haven't put labels and things, but you could imagine what they're like. So we're now moving um, to a slightly different sort of uh, uh, representation for these individual uh, uh, macromolecular uh, systems. Um, and the external components, the slow components, the typical assumption that we tend to make here um, is that uh, it's, it's sort of derived from thermodynamics is that um, uh, the slow components are present in such large numbers that um, binding and unbinding from uh, this graph doesn't actually change their free concentration. So they're like reservoirs in, in thermodynamics. If you take heat from a reservoir, it doesn't change the temperature or return the heat, it doesn't change the temperature. And here we're saying the same thing for the chemical potential or concentration. Right? Now, what we're doing with this representation is that we're actually talking about Markov processes. This, this graph representation is equivalent to continuous time finite state Markov processes, which are well behaved. What, and, and the relationship is shown in the boxes on the right. Um, the label is now the infinitesimal transition rate, which I won't read out for you because you can um, read the formula for yourself. Uh, the Markov process is designed by a conditional probability distribution. And uh, the, the, the edges come from those uh, transitions which have a non-zero infinitesimal rate. And the label is the non-zero infinitesimal rate. Now, if uh, you just unwrap what the Laplacian dynamics is, now it's not the concentrations of components, it's the probability. So our, our conserved total is one. Um, that uh, Laplacian dynamics is precisely the master equation of the, the, the time evolution of the probability distribution, which is a deterministic linear equation. That's the master equation of the Markov process. So this relationship between uh, Markov processes, which have infinitesimal rates and um, uh, graphs is one-to-one. -one. So we're really doing Markov process theory from a graph theoretic standpoint. Okay. All right, so what do we want to do? We want to do timescale separation. So we want the steady state. Um, so if you think about what the, um, um, what the uh, equation implies for steady state, it means that the, we're looking for a vector which is in the zero, the kernel of the Laplacian matrix. Um, and um, I just tell you these things, they're very straightforward. You can read the literature to, if you want to know how to prove that. But um, if the graph is strongly connected, meaning um, I can get from any vertex to any other vertex by uh, a directed path, a path where the edges all go in the same direction. And because it's only two, I can go back. Um, if it's strongly connected, the kernel of the Laplacian is one dimensional. And we can write down a distinguished basis element using a classic resulting graph theory called the matrix tree theorem. And if I pick a vertex I, then this, uh, the basis element at vertex I is given by this prescription that you see on the right. And it's actually very beautiful once you unwrap it. It's saying this, uh, we, we pick a spanning tree rooted at I. Um, so in graph theory, this is a very standard construct. What is a spanning tree? Well, um, it's a subgraph. Uh, which, if I uh, ignore the directions, has no loops on it. That's what it means to be a tree, okay? It's spanning, which means it goes to every vertex. 
and it is rooted at i if i is the only vertex in the graph which has no outgoing edge and it's very easy to take a graph and figure out what the spanning trees are um, if you've got a spanning tree, you take all the labels on the edges, you multiply them together, that's the thing in, in big round brackets, and you add this up over all the spanning trees rooted at I. It's, it's a very beautiful prescription, and this gives you on the nose a basis element in the kernel of the Laplacian. Okay, so now that you have that basis element, if I have a steady state vector, which I'm noting here, steady state probability by an asterisk uh, superscript, then uh, it has to be a, um, uh, a scalar multiple of this basis element. So there's one degree of freedom left, which is essentially the total amount. Uh, and you can determine this by normalizing to the total. And that's the prescription that we get. So the great thing about this is that, of course, we have a linear equation. So what's the problem with this? We solve it with eigenvalues. The problem with this is that we don't know how the eigenvalues depend on the labels in the graph. That's the fundamental problem. Whereas this prescription gives us the steady state in terms of the labels on the edges. So that's the critical point here, okay? All right, so now what happens at thermodynamic equilibrium? Now, uh, at thermodynamic equilibrium, we have to uh, impose equilibrium, uh, the condition of being at equilibrium. This means that the graph is reversible. If I can go from I to J, I can go from J to I, and that is really the reverse transition not just a, a different way of going from J to I, that's important. And detailed balance holes, and I'm sure for this audience, we all are familiar with this, but just to remind you, what this means is that the net flux of probability between the edges is zero. So the probability flux in one direction is equal to the probability flux in the other direction. And if that's the case, then I can actually construct a much simpler basis element. And we've called it mu of G, and you do that in the following way. You start at a reference vertex. It can be any vertex, we'll call it one. Uh, you choose your vertex I, whose steady state you want to calculate, or basis element you want to calculate at. You take any path whatsoever, reversible edges to, from one to I, and you take the product of the label ratios along the path. And that defines an element which is also in the kernel of the of the Laplacian under the condition of thermodynamic equilibrium. Now, you're, you, you'll immediately say, well, hang on, you chose any path and you're calculating this thing along the path. Well, detail balance implies that that quantity is independent of the path. That's a restatement of detail balance. And this is exactly what we mean by path independence and exactly what we meant by path independence when I talked about um, Hopfield's calculation. Okay, this is the fact that the probability, which you can now get by using mu rather than rho in the formula on the previous page at the bottom, uh, now uh, is independent of the path chosen. Okay, so now with this interpretation, um, we can, we're basically recovering equilibrium statistical mechanics because the label ratio that I'm dealing with here can be interpreted as the free energy difference between um, the uh, two vertices when we think of this uh, some free energy landscape in the background from which uh, this, uh, derived, this graph is being derived. Um, and that's the standard prescription of thermodynamics. And when you do that and you can calculate the steady state probabilities, what you see is that the thing in the denominator is just the partition function. It's the partition function for the grand canonical ensemble. So here we have particle exchange with the environment. Um, and what is nice about the linear framework is that it recaptures equilibrium statistical mechanics, but we also have a formula for the steady states, a kind of generalized partition function, if you like, away from equilibrium, arbitrarily away from equilibrium. So this gives us access to non-equilibrium systems. And that's been very important. Okay, so, um, uh, so, so let me just say that like all um, uh, mathematical frameworks, uh, this uh, has been anticipated in some uh, respects and it draws upon many, many uh, aspects of maths and physics. And I've just listed a few of the things that we've over the years come to learn about. Um, and, um, and the citations and dates there 
refer to independent proofs of the matrix tree theorem. And you can see from this that um, uh, the matrix tree theorem has been important and rediscovered in many, many different contexts. Uh, I'll just make two observations here. Um, from the physics viewpoint, I think the, 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 the closest relationship to, to what I'm talking about here comes from the very early and pioneering work of Terrell Hill in biophysics and the somewhat later work of, um, uh, of Schnakenberg, which is something that quite a lot of um, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics people remember, but don't sort of know much about, um, uh, where they introduced this sort of graph theoretic way of studying non-equilibrium systems. I think another very uh, important um, um, kind of root uh, and source of these ideas actually goes back to, in mathematics rather than physics, to the work of Wenzel and Friedlin in large deviation theory. Um, and they were looking at the issue of, um, and they, they were the first to introduce the idea that if you have a very complicated stochastic dynamical system, stochastic differential equation, um, and you're looking at it in the low noise limit, then they were the first to introduce the idea of discretizing this complicated high dimensional uh, energy landscape into a graph. Uh, and it's essentially the discretization that we're talking about here in the equilibrium context, but they considered it in a, in a broader non-equilibrium context where the vertices of the graph are the minima, the local minima of the free energy of, of this, uh, of, of the, this the, the stable steady states of the um, stochastic differential equation. The uh, edges between the minima come from um, certain kinds of, of barrier transitions, metastable states, where you basically have only one negative eigenvalue. These are the sort of critical um, transition states. And then um, the rates uh, over those edges come from large deviation theory, which tells you the sort of escape probability between the two vertices. So this, this large deviation theory uh, view, I think is, is a very important way to see how these kinds of graphs emerge from the sort of much richer I I idea of sort of stochastic differential equations uh, describing sort of physical systems. Um, and this kind of view has been very much used in the chemical physics literature more recently in the work of David Wales and others. So uh, this is just to say uh, the linear, threat, like all things, uh, is related to a, to, a, to a substantial and deep historical um, uh, work. Um, and it draws on, um, what I like about it is that it draws both on physics and on mathematics and, 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 bring, and different branches of both physics and mathematics. And, and that's what makes it um, interesting. So you might ask, so what's special about it, right? Why, 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 why not just do what Schnackenberg was doing or Wenzel Friedling was doing? What's, what's different? And uh, I, I, if I had to, to put a, a finger on it, I would say that um, what is different about it is that it, uh, for us, the graph, we take the graph seriously. And in my view, I think for all these other treatments, the graph is a means to an end, it's infrastructure. To us, it's building, not infrastructure. Um, it's a mathematical entity. It allows us to describe biochemical systems rigorously. And I think what is most important is, is allows us to actually prove theorems which rise above the molecular complexity. Um, and I, I'll just mention one um, paper here. I don't want to discuss it in detail, but it has a particular connection to this conference because it originated from a visit that Debashish made to Boston, where he gave a talk and precipitated a discussion and a very fun collaboration, which led to this paper. And I think uh, it illustrates well this idea of how this graph theoretic way of, of doing Markov processes, if you like, um, it, it helps one to formulate very general theorems that the graph sort of allows you to specify what's important, but also allows you to leave all the other important things. Uh, it's just a graph. It can be anything you like. Um, and so if you want to sort of see that aspect of it, I think this paper is, is a good place to, to start. And uh, as you see, uh, leads to this conference through uh, this uh, collaboration. Um, so, um, OK, so, so that's the linear framework. Um, so let me move on now and talk about um, uh, some applications. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll um, excuse me, ah, just reload my caffeine um, uh, as we change pace here. Um, I'm going to talk about gene regulation. So I'm sure everyone knows what this is. 
but let me um, draw your attention to uh, something that I've always found particularly interesting about it. And this is the vast increase in, in regulatory complexity between bacteria, um, shown at the top of the slide, and uh, this hardly uh, captures the complexity we find in eukaryotes in, in the bottom of the slide. Um, and um, I, I, without going into too much detail, I would point out two uh, important aspects of what's going on here. One is um, that in bacteria, the regulatory um, structure, so when I say regulation, I mean really all of what happens before the recruitment of polymerase to the transcription start site. So this is taking um, uh, Mark Potashny's idea of regulated recruitment. Um, to, uh, this, is, this is sort of in, uh, starting from that point of view. Um, I think that's a reasonable starting point. It's not the whole story and we can discuss that if you're interested, but I think it's a reasonable starting point. Um, in bacteria, everything sort of happens very close to the transcription start site. There's some looping, um, but things touch and, and, you know, transcription factors sort of talk pretty directly to the, to the transcriptional machinery. Um, and everything is local where locality is measured more or less in the 1D dimension along the genome. Okay. And you get to you bacteria and the situation is exploded. Um, every, the information, both the information in the gene, which is broken up into exons and introns, but the regulatory information is now strewn megabases potentially away from the transcription start site, sometimes on other chromosomes. Um, somehow, all of that information has to integrate and brought into a local space. Um, and uh, so, so, so the problem is now a 3D problem uh, within the nucleus. And what you see, unlike in the bacterial setting, is that the regulation the process of bringing, uh, recruiting polymerase to the transcription start site seems to involve an enormous amount of energy expenditure, moving chromatin, reorganizing nucleosomes, and vast amounts of post-translational modification, which is essentially, a, again, a dissipative process. Okay, so, so these two aspects, I think, are, are very, very interesting. And I think we're still in the infancy of trying to understand how um, they work in eukaryotic cells. Um, and I would also say that, by and large, the models that we've uh, typically used to understand what happens in, in, uh, in gene regulation, inherited from classical studies in bacteria, have been equilibrium models. Um, but I think we have entered now a period of time where the data is really uh, making us rethink this. And that's really what I want to discuss today. Okay. so. Um, so, so this is a particular uh, gene. We uh, work in collaboration with my um, colleague, uh, Angela de Pace, um, on uh, regulation in Drosophila. It's a wonderful model system to study genes. It's a living embryo. It's not an artificial system. You can do genetic uh, perturbations uh, more or less at will. It's uh, uh, wonderful to image in. So it's a, it's a very convenient, um, powerful experimental system. And we're looking here, that's a, a microgopher expression of hunchback. It's, um, this is <coughs> the Drosophila embryo <coughs> in early nuclear cycle 14, just prior to cellularization. So it's actually a, a syncytium. The cell walls have not yet emerged. You're seeing the nuclei stain there. Uh, for hunchback, it's uh, one of these uh, gap genes that's uh, very early on in the, um, in the cascade of patterning that takes place in the embryo. Um, hunchback is regulated by, as you see at the top right there, by three enhancers, the one that's important here at this particular time is the proximal enhancer, the, uh, the P2 enhancer. Um, and this has a structure with binding sites for many transcription factors uh, shown there, uh, of which the one uh, which is conventionally thought to be the most important at this time is bicoid, which is a maternal morphogen. It's given, it's a protein uh, that's translated from mRNA provided by the mother. And um, uh, that's not quite right, as we'll see, but, but Bitcoin is the thing that we're going to focus on. Uh, and if you measure hunchback, <coughs> excuse me, hunchback and bicoid um, as a function of egg length uh, in the graph at the bottom, what you see is that bicoid has this more or less exponential decay from the anterior left hand to the posterior right hand. And bicoid has this expression which is strong in the anterior and then falls off very sharply. Um, and then you see a little bit of expression at the at the at the um, 
uh, posterior end as well. But we'll focus on this on this fall off. And what's interesting here is how uh, rapidly, or at least as the change in concentration of bicoid uh, goes down a little bit, the uh, the represent the um, concentration of, of of hunchback drops very sharply. So this is this is sharpness. And what we're going to do is to study this um, problem of sharpness. Okay, so uh, the sharpness has been measured by various authors. This is a, a paper from a quartet of very distinguished Princeton authors who very carefully measured um, this. Now, um, so they're representing it here. Um, Bicoid was declining over uh, egg length. Um, hunchback was declining. They've flipped this the other way around. So now we're looking at things increasing. So if you if you normalize bicoid concentration and hunchback concentration as shown here uh, in, in the plot on the left and you um, plot the data, what you see is that it's extremely well fitted to a hill function with hill coefficient of five. People get different measurements, five, six, um, but in that range. And um, the hill function, as you will all know, uh, was uh, introduced uh, by Archibald Vivian Hill, um, British, uh, one of the founders of biophysics. Uh, in, to study hemoglobin. And Hill was very clear that this was simply a, a very simple algebraic form that was a fit to the data. It didn't have any biochemical meaning. You could, you could, you could make some story about it, but it wasn't anything a biochemist would believe. Um, and um, uh, uh, over the years, uh, people have sought to find mechanistic meaning in the Hill coefficient H. Um, and every so often someone writes a, a rant in the literature saying, no, you can't do that because it's just a fit. Okay. So what we're going to do here is to, to uh, study this sharpness. And what we'll discover is that actually the Hill function is not just a fit. It turns out that it has some meaning, um, biophysical meaning. Um, and that brings me to the next part of the talk, the Hill function. Um, and uh, it turns out is a Hopfield barrier. Okay. So uh, we're going to uh, model uh, regulation of hunchback with this um, uh, graph that I showed you earlier. Uh, we think of um, uh, uh, a gene um, regulated by multiple transcription factor binding sites. There can be N, they're shown two here, along with uh, polymerase, which is recruited to its own site. Um, and so you can imagine that this graph can have any number of binding sites. And, uh, we're kind of, there, there could be a lot more in the background, of course, chromosomes and other co-regulators and things. And what we're assuming is that these things in the background are determining the rates of these transitions. So we, are, we imagine that these uh, labels could be really arbitrary. We have no control over them because of, uh, we don't know what's in the background. So, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a kind of uh, assumption, but that's the one we're going to to, that's how we're going to deal with the, um, think of uh, the role of all the things that are not present in the model as determining these labels. Okay, and we're going to um, construct a, a gene regulation function, which uh, shows how um, uh, the uh, output is related to the input, the input being the concentration of um, the transcription factor. This would be bicoid in the case of the application. Um, and the output is simply the, the probability of polymerase being bound. And this, again, is merely restating uh, Patashny's regulated recruitment idea that um, transcription is about recruiting the polymerase. So this is just taking the probability that uh, steady state probability that um, uh, polymerase has been recruited. OK, so, so we have an input output function f of x. Um, and um, uh, the machinery that I've told you about in the linear framework gives us a way to calculate f of x in terms of the labels or the parameters. That we're with. Okay, so um, to study sharpness, um, and this is really a rather important point, people often sort of fit things to hill functions, get a hill coefficient, and uh, really a much more insight emerges by, by thinking about the shape of this function in a more... Uh, uh, subtle way by particularly uh, by looking at at least two measures of how the shape is changing. And the two measures that we um, use are what we call position and steepness. And I ap apologize, these are appalling um, names, but we chose them and then we couldn't stop using them. So they become embedded. Um, and what they are is very straightforward. First of all, we normalize uh, the function. So 
Um, it's, it's already normalized to maximum because we're looking at probabilities. Um, so the vertical axis is normalized. And we normalize the horizontal axis by doing what they did with the experimental data, which is normalizing to the half maximal value. Now that's actually a subtle normalization because it's different for every function, obviously, right? But now we have something which is non-dimensional in both its input and its output. And in that non-dimensional form, what we call the steepness is the maximum of the derivative. And what we call the position is the normalized x-axis, the y-coordinate at which that maximum is achieved, okay? So it's very important here that we use these two measures, not just one, to understand sharpness. Okay, position steepness. Okay, so here I'm showing you a collage of uh, theory and experiment. Um, uh, and this is a position steepness plot. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. So let me work through this um, bit by bit. Um, so the first thing to focus on is this curved blue line. This is the locus of position and steepness for the hill functions. Okay, very easy. You just take, it's already normalized. So you take the derivative, you calculate the, the maximum and the, and the position. It's easy to do by hand. Um, and you'll notice that um, it has a singularity at, uh, at position one, but otherwise it has this, this curve. So, so this is a landmark in position steepness space is the uh, locus of the hill functions. Okay, so now let's focus on the gray region. The gray region comes by looking at gene regulation functions now for uh, six sites of binding and polymerase, okay? Um, and uh, we randomly sample parameter values uh, within some range. And um, we get a gene regulation, we normalize it, calculate position and steepness, we get a point. And we have an algorithm for growing from that point to determine the region occupied under these conditions. So I won't go through the boring part of the algorithm for doing this. The numerics are kind of tricky. You have to sort of grow and then you have to sort of shrink and you have to be careful to get the boundary right. Um, and, uh, and, and then you get this, this gray boundary and it's mostly very well converged. The bottom right is still a little iffy. The numerics get, for some reason, we don't entirely understand, get a little iffy there, but we're not particularly worried about this. What is interesting here is that this region has this cusp, which you can't see because it's kind of obscured by the data, but I will tell you, that the peak of the cusp lies exactly on the hill line just below hill six. Okay, so now what happens if I increase the range of, of sampling for the parameters? Right? Well, what happens is that the, the, the boundary sort of grows slightly outwards and the cusp gets closer to hill six. But what happens if you start sort of increasing the range is that you find that this boundary actually stabilizes. So it turns out that there's an asymptotic boundary. You can pick the parameters in whatever range you like, and they'll all fall within this shape shown here. So, so this becomes a sort of parameter independent region. It's not dependent on the range of sampling of the parameters. So uh, what seems to happen with the cast is that the increased parametric range, you get closer and closer to hill six, you never get beyond it. So hill six for six sites, seems to be a barrier, okay. All right, so uh, that's the gray area. And now I've got two sets of data here. So one set of data is for the Hunchback P2 enhancer. There's a reporter for, uh, for this. It's the wild type enhancer, it does all the binding sites. And each little red dot that you see there is um, a measurement from an embryo. Um, and it's showing the position steepness from the actual experimental data, the, the big red dot uh, in the middle is the average over all of these. And as you see, uh, the data is sort of in the region and sort of not. Um, but the problem with the wild type enhancer, of course, is that it has these other binding sites. So we're not quite clear whether this is a good representation of the model we have, right? Which has only Bitcoin, one transcription factor. So what we did, um, shown here at the bottom, if we construct a synthetic enhancer in which all of the other binding sites have been removed by essentially randomizing the sequence in such a way that it avoids all motifs that are known for the transcription factors in Drosophila. So computationally, as far as we know, nothing binds there, except for Bitcoin. Um, 
which is exactly the same as well type. And the data for this, this synthetic enhancer is shown there. And what you see is that it's actually all clustering around um, six, which is kind of interesting. Um, and clearly the other binding sites matter because there's a definitely a shift here. But, but it's a little equivocal. Some of these points fall within the region, some fall out. So you wouldn't want to make a, you wouldn't want to bet your life on whether the model was adequately representing this or not. However, it becomes very clear when you do some deletions and the ones shown in the insert there, if you take the first three sites out and you plot the data, what you see is that there is no way you can explain the data under the assumptions that we've made for this model here. And of course, I probably didn't say, but you can read it. Uh, this was all of this, the gray area here is the equilibrium region. All right. So now you can see where this is going. Um, this, uh, and this is true for any number of sites that we've been able to simulate up to 12. Um, the, uh, the, you get this region, it has a cusp, it's, it's the hill function for the number of sites is, the, uh, is, is a barrier to, to this region. But is it a hot fill barrier? In other words, uh, what happens if I uh, expend energy? Okay, so here um, I'm showing you a plot. Now, uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm showing it to you for two sites. And you might say, well, hang on, you were showing six on the other side, why two? I'm sorry, there's a reason for this and we'll come to it in a moment. So we have to live with this for, for now. And what you see here is the, um, the plot for the equilibrium region, again, in blue. Uh, in blue, it, it, you can see again, uh, it, it's, it's got this cusp, it's not very, you know, kind of tight, uh, narrow angle, but again, it's, it's where I said it would be, it's just below hill two for two sites. And now the black area, that's the non-equilibrium region. So now we don't impose detailed balance in our parametric sampling and uh, it's, the parameters are arbitrary. Um, and this is not uh, an asymptotic boundary, it's within a range. Um, and we don't know whether we get a similar asymptotic boundary here. Um, and what you see is that we, with two sites, can get almost to hill coefficient four away from equilibrium. So, so this brings us to one of the conclusions from this analysis, which is this idea um, that the Hill function is the hot field barrier for the sharpness of gene regulation by a single transcription factor uh, acting uh, on a gene. Okay. So the Hill function, which has always been thought of as this sort of fit, uh, re-emerges with actual biophysical meaning. It's, it's a somehow some kind of limiting object in this thermodynamic sense. It's a, it's a Hopfield barrier. Okay, so um, uh, we have a few minutes. So let me, um, um, let me move on here to uh, talk about uh, some of the, uh, the, the rocks underneath this story that I've told you about, and you've already seen one of them, which is I've had to go from n equals six when I was plotting the equilibrium region to n equals two. Uh, what's going on here? And, and this, I think, really gets us to the heart of uh, the challenge of working away from thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, and, um, uh, and it uh, really is a, uh, we, we know that we don't have a, a, a developed theory of non-equilibrium behavior. There's been a lot of enormous progress in, in the field. Uh, wonderful work, uh, uh, results of uh, Jasinski, Crooks, others, um, um, about systems far from equilibrium, but we still do not have a systematic theory of it. Um, but I think uh, within this sort of garden of graph theory Markov processes, we have a very clear way to understand some of the problems that we encounter. Um, and it really comes back to the matrix tree theorem, uh, which I've reproduced there. Okay, and, and we can see from this um, sort of three of the really uh, challenges that we face here. The first is that um, uh, imagine we have a graph represented by, you know, a system represented by a graph. Uh, it's at equilibrium, okay? And at equilibrium, we know we have path independence. Uh, to calculate the steady state probability of a vertex, I take any path from the reference vertex I calculate the product to the labor ratios that gives me the steady state probability. It doesn't depend on what path I take. I can take anything. 
Um, let's imagine that I take a, a single edge and I, and, I, and I change its rate so that label, so that it's now away from equilibrium. So I'm just introducing energy at one edge, which may be a long way from the vertex I'm interested in, but it's anywhere. The moment I do that, uh, the picture disappears. This this very simple picture disappears completely, because what um, uh, the matrix tree te theorem tells us is that now the steady state probability of this thing, which depended just on the labels on a path at equilibrium, now depends on every label throughout the graph. It's global parameter dependence, and that's just a consequence of the fact that spanning trees have to have to reach. You know, ev every label will appear on a spanning tree. Uh, it's easy to see. So, so somehow, suddenly you've got this global parameter dependence. Okay, so th this is hideous, right? Obviously, because um, it makes it very complicated to, to know how this is changing. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is a consequence, again, of the matrix tree theorem, which is that in order to exactly calculate this steady state probability, I, I have to enumerate all the spanning trees. How many are there? Okay, well, this is, this is really bad news. Right, because it's very easy to see, and the, the, there's formulas for this, so you don't have to actually count them. Um, that if I have the graph that I showed you with two transcription factor bounding sites and polymerase, the one on, shown on the left, then, uh, and because it's reversible, the number of spanning trees rooted at a vertex is the same, it's independent of the vertex. There are 384 spanning trees rooted at any vertex. Okay, so that's bad, but it's okay. We can deal with that, and, and, and we had to in order to plot the region that I'm showing you there. I go from two to three transcription factor binding sites, and the number of spanning trees goes up to 42 million. Okay, there is no way that you can work with that. And that's why we were restricted to showing n equals two. Now, there are other ways of doing it, but it actually only gets us to n equals three rather than that. So, um, so, so, the, so the, the combinatorics, the complexities are dreadful here, okay. Um, and, uh, and, and this tells us something about physics, and it's very interesting because this has been a source of contention with the physicists who come to my lab. We have big arguments about, you know, physics versus mathematics. Uh, I accuse them of throwing away spanning trees because that's the only way you can do it. If you want to say something about a non-equilibrium steady state, you ain't going to look at 42 million spanning trees. You're going to throw most of them away and hope that the, uh, the ones that you've kept are the ones that are important, right? And that's typical in physics, you approximate. Now, that's fine, but the problem is, what about those situations where you can't do that? What happens when actually the steady state probability is being influenced by many spanning trees, many paths, if you like? And in that case, uh, you might actually imagine that that's probably quite likely in biology because biology is all about sort of lots of little interactions coming together to, to make functional effects. That's, you might see that that's a consequence of its evolutionary construction. So this, this approximation that we, we fall into when we're doing physics might in fact be blinding us uh, from much of the behavior that is actually important in biology. Okay, so, so this combinatorial explosion illustrates, uh, I think, a very significant issue that we have to come to terms with in, in looking at these kinds of systems. And then finally, you know, this formula is beautiful. As a mathematician, I look at it and say, wow, yeah, that's great. It's, it's really elegant. It's beautiful. And a physicist looks at it and say, what? Uh, there's no interpretation here. There's no physics. There's no, uh, it's just trees. You can't see the wood for the trees. So this lack of physical interpretation has been a huge issue. Um, and despite all the progress in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, I think this issue of trying to understand non-equilibrium steady states, particularly from when you look at it through the lens of the graph theory, um, this problem has been a real challenge. Okay, so, so that's the darkness. Um, and let me finish up by saying there is actually some light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, so this is very recent work. Um, it, it was actually posted on archive just um, a few days ago. Um, and I, I know I, I won't go into it in detail, but I just want to sort of give you a hint of why it's, for us, uh, was exciting because it seems to be, uh, uh, after many years of effort, sort of uh, 
giving us a, a, a toehold on the problems uh, on the previous page. Um, so so uh, because the fact the matrix three term tells us, you know, it's an exact result for the steady state probability, um, there's no way around this. Um, so it is what it is. So the only thing we can hope to do if we're not going to approximate is we have to sort of reorganize the complexity and reorganize it, hopefully, with a way which gives it some physical meaning, but also makes it more calculable. Um, so, so here uh, is what you can do. Um, so we're going to look again at paths um, from uh, a vertex I of interest to the reference vertex. So we're going backwards. It's just a sign, so don't worry about that. Um, and we're going to look at minimal paths. What's a minimal path? A minimal path is one with no repeated vertices and therefore no repeated edges. Okay, so, so there are finitely many of these. Okay, so, so, so just minimal paths. And we're going to take advantage of what's called local detail balance. Local detail balance is uh, something that's uh, principle of stochastic thermodynamics justified in a number of uh, more or less complicated cases which says that this quantity that we were looking at, this product of labor ratios actually has an interpretation. It's the exponential of the entropy production along the path. Okay, so that's, I'm just gonna treat that as a definition. It's the entropy produced in the environment and in the system along the path, total entropy production along the path, SP. Okay, so I can reinterpret what I told you about thermodynamic equilibrium by saying that steady state probabilities are proportional. So I'm forgetting the denominator here. It's probability, so you just have to add them up to normalize, right? Um, the steady state probability is, um, can be written here as the exponential of minus the entropy. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's just path independence. It doesn't matter what path I pick, I get the same entropy. Okay. Now, what's interesting is that you can actually rephrase or rewrite the non-equilibrium steady state probability using essentially the same kind of language, where now, instead of taking uh, the entropy along a path, and it doesn't depend on what path you take, you take the entropy along each path, each minimal path, but you take the average entropy over a probability distribution on spanning trees rooted at one. And this probability distribution, we call it the arboreal distribution. And I won't, I won't go into it, it's, it's if you want to, to see the details, I, I'm happy to tell you afterwards or you can read the paper. But there is a probability distribution on spanning trees rooted at one. And for each spanning tree rooted at one, there is a unique path from every vertex to one. So uh, that's the connection between the P inside and the T outside. So this formulation gives a much more physical meaning to non-equilibrium steady state probabilities. They're averages of path entropies, of minimal path entropies over this distribution, which to us is still rather mysterious, this arboreal distribution, but it's a genuine probability distribution. Okay. Now the crunch is that this representation has a much better scaling than the one that we talked about previously, because if I imagine a system at equilibrium now, and I change uh, one edge away from equilibrium, then the number of distinct, distinct minimal path entropies is very limited. There are basically only three sets of uh, minimal path entropies, and it's not hard to see why. Um, and and if, you, if you now break data balance at more and more edges, of course, the combinatorics gets worse, but, but, but they depend only on the number of edges of what we call energetic edges. It doesn't depend on the size of the graph. So the graph could be enormous. The number of uh, spanning trees could be gigantic. It doesn't matter. And this gives us a way to do calculations on systems that were previously intractable. So we think that this is actually potentially a very powerful uh, way forward in trying to unravel what happens in this sort of non-equilibrium landscape. OK. So I'll leave it at that. The paper's on the archive, as I said, if you want to, to see the details, uh, which I've glossed over here. Okay. So um, I think we're uh, out of time, so I will stop there. I, I'd like to uh, make a special mention of my uh, department colleague, Angela de Pace. It was uh, conversations with Angela over a long period of time that led to uh, this interest in gene regulation um, and um, uh, a very uh, fun collaboration.
Uh, and I mentioned particularly Jihei Park, a postdoc in Angela's lab, who got the data that I showed a few slides ago. Um, and uh, this is um, our lab um, uh, and some of the students who have contributed over the years to the linear framework uh, and the people who've given us money to do all this. Um, and um, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for a very interesting talk. We will now request the audience if they, to ask questions if they have any. So the floor is open for questions. Either you can unmute yourself and ask, or you can type in. So I think I prefer that you unmute and ask so that we can, we can directly ask the question. OK, so we can begin. Mm. Yeah. A question. I mean, it's not really a question. It's a sort of a comment, but you can uh, sort of correct me. So you said I think there's a problem. I could not hear him. Yeah, Devashis seems to have frozen, unfortunately. We'll wait for a second and see. Yeah, he might come back. Uh, or we could send him a chat, I suppose. Yes. Let me try. And if he's frozen, he may not get the chat as well. Maybe someone can call him and tell that. Hey, let me see. There was, we could not hear you. Lost you. Um, Should I repeat my question? Uh, co comment? OK. So let, let, let me remit, uh, repeat. So what I'm saying that all the pathways which are leading to say the node i mm -hmm. so that is bringing them there and denominator is sort of normalization so it comes very close to the physicist intuition so when you said that physicists may not like it i, I thought physicists should like it because it's such intuitively you know uh, appealing that whatever they're bringing into that root they are in the numerator and denominator is normalization over all possibilities for the others so do, yeah, do, do you agree with me with that? Uh, yeah, so I, uh, I think it, uh, I, I would agree with you. I think it becomes more um, uh, palatable with this, um, with this probability distribution, which is uh, exactly as you say, it's, you know, it's a probability distribution on the trees and the trees are the sort of vehicle through which, um, uh, if you like, uh, the information or energy is reaching a particular vertex. Um, so once you think of it in that in that way, um, I, I do think you're right that it becomes more akin to some of the other things you see in physics, where you have sort of path formulations of various kinds. You know, I mean, even in quantum mechanics, there's some kind of path formulation. You're taking some action over over paths. So I think in that sense, the analogy becomes closer. I think what's what's more, more difficult to contemplate is this universe of spanning trees that one has to sort of live with. Uh, and this distribution, this probability distribution is a distribution on the spanning trees. So getting an intuition for this, because there's so many of these things, you know, they, and, and the more the complicated the graph goes, the more intricate and bizarre these things become. No, I agree uh, that the size is a problem uh, as, as, as you have already pointed out. But uh, as far as the intuitive appeal is concerned, I thought you know, physicists should like it because of this connection with the intuition. But yeah, I mean, I can only, um, you know, I mean, experiment is always good in these matters. And I can only say that uh, one of the puzzles for me, I remember talking about this with you when, when you came to visit us, that um, uh, Schnackenberg's work in particular, which is in reviews of modern physics, a lot of people are not very familiar with this and somehow, the graph uh, theory perspective, it's come back, people have rediscovered it and, and there's a lot more work using it now. But I think uh, I had a sense that it faded out of view and people, I, I, I don't know why physicists became uncomfortable with it. Um, and I suppose I was speculating that it might have been because of this sea of trees that feels like a mathematician's true, true. paradise, but not a physicist's paradise. Uh, Jeremy, it's uh, Jordan Horowitz here. Hey, Jordan. Uh, I, hi. Uh, I wanted to thank you for the very nice talk. I wanted to kind of drill down a bit more in this uh, Hopfield barrier idea, uh -huh. which you kind of laid out 
uh, very high level as saying, you know, there's some limit at equilibrium or detailed balance and you need to burn energy to go beyond that limit. Um, but it's, it's my feeling that often equilibrium is not enough to place a limit on things. There's usually in a lot of these biochemical examples, there's other hidden constraints that kind of like lay out the Pareto front. Um, and I can give you an example like discrimination, right? I mean, there's no limit to discrimination at equilibrium if you can change the free energy of the binding. You can always make it better if just the right binds really, really strong. So in thinking about this idea, how, how do you think about this idea? How do you incorporate those constraints and place those limits in kind of a general context? Um, yeah, so I think, uh, so, so I have two comments on that. One is, I, I think you're right that the, the uh, these thermodynamic limits may be um, may be quite weak in the context of actual biochemistry. That there might be other many other constraints that even for systems at equilibrium will be much more limited by in in practice. Um, but I don't think that's always true. And I think the example I, I showed of um, gene regulation um, is is a case in point where. Um, the measured data on, on hunchback, you know, for a synthetic system, which seems to accord well with the model that we're, we're looking at, um, is pretty much at, uh, you know, kind of very close to, to, to what could be achieved at, uh, at, at equilibrium. I mean, we don't think it is being achieved at equilibrium for exactly that reason, um, that you do need uh, uh, energy to get past it. Um, so, so I think in, in some contexts, the constraints, the other biochemical constraints might be less of a important than perhaps in, in the, say in the case of gene regulation. Um, I mean, that's just a speculation. I think we don't know enough yet to be able to make a good, um, a good case uh, for that. Um, but I think for us, what's been useful about uh, thinking about this Hopfield barrier idea is that uh, it gives us a sort of aiming point for trying to understand um, the capabilities of particular kinds of systems. Um, it's uh, encouraging us to, uh, to introduce a sort of functional perspective to, to sort of think about systems, to define in, in biophysical terms, what functions they're, they're exhibiting. I mean, uh, the case of gene regulations, it's relatively straightforward, but other forms of information processing, perhaps not quite so straightforward. And it gives us something to really ask about uh, in terms of uh, and, and prove ab about the behavior of these systems. So I think for us, it's been a sort of encouragement to take that kind of following the energy approach. I don't know if that really sort of answers your question. I'm sort of agreeing with you, but saying, um, yes, yes, these, these limits are probably weak, but nevertheless, I think it's a good idea to try to identify them. Maybe I was asking a bit more like, how, how do you decide to put the extra constraints in, right? I mean, I think for the gene regulation, you probably said that, you know, um, free energies of binding only affected off rates and not on rates in, in designing that network, things like that. Was um, it completely? In the, no, in the gene regulation case, it was completely free. Um, we didn't okay. impose That's any. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and so in particular, the, as you know, this is an asymptotic boundary. So um, the assumptions on the on the parameters, I mean, the, you know, they can be anything as long as they're positive. Um, so, so, so that, uh, and that's that's kind of what my point that um, at least in this case, and I wouldn't want to speak more generally. Um, it does seem that um, these limits are meaningful. Cool. Thank you. More questions. Hi, Jeremy. Uh, hey, Mohit. Hi. Um, really nice talk. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the linear framework that you talked about. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if that can be applied to understand time scale separation in the context of different layers of regulation that you mentioned. So we all have heard about metabolic reactions being much faster than transcription, being much faster than translation, and then going into epigenetics. But then there are metabolic reactions that influence the epigenetic state itself. So I'm wondering if each of them is a quasi steady state in itself, how can these time scales get con potentially convoluted and are there some frameworks we can apply there? Um, yeah, so I think that's a tricky question for us, Mohit, because um, what I would say is that 
you can imagine um, a hierarchy of time scales right. that are present in a biochemical system, right? And uh, if you recall, I showed uh, some of the uh, systems that we had begun to study initially, these post-translational modification systems. Mm -hmm. Um, and in effect, what we're doing there is a sort of hierarchical timescale separation because we're sort of saying, well, these enzyme mechanisms, they're happening fastest. They've reached steady state and they're contributing uh, to the rates of this other system through their steady states, not through their kinetics. Right? So, so that's sort of saying, well, that's very fast. This is not so fast, but it's still reaching steady state. Um, and so I think in principle, you, you, could, you could implement uh, a more systematic sort of hierarchy of timescales through this kind of process. Um, so, so I think that is one possible approach to the, the question that you raised. Um, I have to say that we haven't yet had sufficient uh, experience of uh, how effective these are. I mean, I think post-translational modification, one of the reasons why, you know, we've kind of moved away from that, it's very, very difficult to get the experimental data to, to, to look at post-translational modification states. Um, so I think the theory has been more about trying to fill out our conceptual understanding of what these kinds of systems are doing. I think when we come to gene regulation, it's a different matter. We have data, we can look, we can see what's going on. Um, but, you know, I think in principle, I could imagine that one could use these even in, in contexts like sort of cellular systems where you could imagine making, it's basically a Markov process, right? So if you have a Markov process of some kind, there's no reason why you couldn't operate the same thing. So that's about as far as we've got in thinking about this, this very significant issue of, of, you know, how the time scales are linked up. And I think, you know, it's one thing to do that, but I think then you sort of, morally required to ask, when is this hierarchy a reasonable way to look at the system? Uh, and I think I don't see that there's really been any uh, real systematic effort to understand that yet. Okay, all right, thank you. More questions? Okay, uh, while maybe others are waiting, I have a question. Uh, so you were saying that there's a large number of spanning trees and then uh, the difficulty in finding the important ones. So is this a Monte Carlo way of finding the important ones? Yeah. Um, I guess in any particular case where you've got numerical values for the edge labels. Well, these um, are rates, no? These edge labels are rates. They're rates, exactly. Um, then um, you could imagine various kinds of sampling processes that would perhaps give you a hint of out of this sort of sea of trees, yeah. which ones are dominating that particular you know, kind of numerical um, situation. Um, yeah, um, I suppose uh, <coughs> I have to confess as a mathematician, I'm always drawn to trying to get exact sure. calculations um, and regard, uh, you know, that kind of approach as a kind of last resort. I mean, we do it all the time, of course, but um, um, I, and I think uh, that in principle could be very informative about the situations where this huge complexity actually isn't that complicated, that it, it, it really means you only have to look at some subset of trees in these particular contexts. But I think then it becomes very dependent on the par parametric regime that one is in. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. No questions? Um, I've got a question in the chat. Oh, okay, yes, yeah. Should I read it or you could? Uh, perhaps you could run it and, and then that might make it easier. Yeah, yeah. So let me read. It's from. Uh, so the question is Thanks for the nice talk. If I understood well, in your gene regulation example, you've shown that the system operates out of equilibrium but reaches performance close to the equilibrium bound. Do you have any idea why and what is the, sorry, what is then the real benefit of being out of equilibrium in this case? 
Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, so, um, I think the issue of what's going on in gene regulation is complicated by the fact that the cell presumably has to achieve many ends in um, transcribing a gene. Um, and not all of that is reflected in the model that we have. So for instance, we're in Drosophila, uh, it has chromatin. Um, the nuclear cell structure around the P2 enhancer, to my knowledge, is not well understood. Um, we have data that shows that it's almost certainly playing a role in constructing this sharpness because you can interfere with various components of the mediator complex, which is a, 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 a massive multiprotein complex that conveys information from transcription factors to the machinery. It's not present in the model, but it's behind the scenes. And if you interfere with some of the histone modifying uh, components of this, uh, you, you, you see that in changes in the sharpness. So, um, so I think in the actual context of um, the hunchback gene, um, there is uh, work going on behind the scenes that is um, expending energy. Um, and we think that this is where part of this non-equilibrium behavior is coming from. It's speculation. We don't have convincing evidence of that other than this, this kind of indirect, uh, 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 you know, kind of genetic perturbations in the, in the machinery. Um, and uh, so, so, so I think um, what's actually happening is that all of this other, this complexity behind the scenes is requiring energy and that's where it comes in. Now, the other aspect of your question, which I think is very interesting is how is it that it manages to reach, uh, you know, the equilibrium bound? Well, okay, so how do you get the equilibrium bound? Um, so we have this, you know, kind of region of uh, equilibrium behavior, position steepness. And if you start asking, um, how do you get gene regulation function sort of close to Hill 6 or Hill N, if they're in transcription sector sites? Well, it turns out that actually it's not straightforward because um, you have to construct, um, uh, a, a, you have to have a lot of cooperativity. Uh, and, and what I mean by a lot of cooperativity is two things. So when we think about cooperativity, the classical way to think about it is that, you know, you have two sites, bind, something is binding to each of these sites and binding at one site changes the association constant for binding at the other side. And that's how cooperativity was originally defined by Linus Pauling. It's pairwise, all right? So it's cooperativity between two sides. Okay. If that's all you have, there's absolutely no way you can get uh, gene regulation functions which are close to Hill 6. It's easy to see that. What you require is you require higher order cooperativity. Higher order cooperativity is where the association constant for binding at a site is modulated by whether or not multiple other sites are bound. And, you know, which other sites? Well, it depends on the subset. So now, you know, it's not just one higher order cooperativity, lots of them, right? So what you need in order to get up into this, uh, close to this hill function is higher order cooperativity of all orders up to six, the number of sites you have. So that is actually not so straightforward to understand where this higher order cooperativity comes from if you're at equilibrium. Um, and in fact, there may be ways of doing it, but it's uh, using, uh, you know, kind of mono changeo kind of ideas, sort of allostery. Uh, and we have another paper uh, that's discussing this. But, but what I would summarize it by saying is that it's not at all straightforward to do that at equilibrium. So that may be the other half of the answer to your question. Um, not only is there actual energy expenditure, but if you really try to do it at equilibrium, well, it looks like a lot of work. Um, I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer, but 
Yeah, thank you. Sorry, now now I I, I can talk without too many uh, background noises. Uh, Hi, gentlemen. Yeah. How? Um, and I was also thinking, you know, like I, I come, yeah, a bit of a speculation here. I come from like a phase separation community. Um, okay. And there, you know, like the word cooperativity is no, it seems to be a keyword. And I'm wondering whether like that um, could be one of the explanation, the possible explanation of how to, you know, cooperatively kind of um, bind to the, the transcription factor sides. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, so are you saying that it might emerge through um, phase separation? For, for example, yeah, for yeah. example. Absolutely. Um, so, so I think um, um, uh, we, you could almost imagine that phase separation creates a kind of very large ensemble yeah, exactly. <laughs> of, uh, of states. Um, and, and certainly you would imagine from the dynamics of that ensemble, apart from anything else, that that would be a way of transferring information between multiple sets of sites. Yeah. So I would absolutely imagine that that would be a, a way in which um, higher order forms of cooperativity could be implemented. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. That's exactly what I, I was speculating about. More questions? Okay, so if there are no more questions, we will uh, end the session. Devashish, do you have any comments more? Uh, no, I would like to thank uh, Jeremy for a wonderful talk. And I thank Ranjit for sharing the session. So it has been a great session. And uh, well, we look forward to uh, Jeremy's visit next time when we have in-person uh, meeting. Me too. Uh, I have to say, I very much regret that uh, it wasn't possible to be there in person, but I hope it will be possible uh, next time. That would be great. And um, and if anyone does have any questions or thinks of anything, just send me an email. You have my. Sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye, everyone.